name is Thomas Timbergen. Um, let me tell you a little bit about like running an OSPO, the open source and inner server way, uh, a method that I have been practicing now for, for many, many years, and give you a little bit of insight of the uh, why I do this, what it means, and how. Um, so I am currently the head of open source program office at EPAM, that's a um, transformation services and product engineering company. And I was formerly the uh, head of open source at Heat Technologies. I've been running OSPOS for now eight years, I think, but I've been long involved in the open source community. Um, I basically, I on a daily basis, I help my own organization with all, um, all kinds of open source questions, but I also help uh, uh, various clients with their open source management or supply chain security. I'm involved in a lot of open source projects, uh, as you can see uh, listed here. Um, I think during the presentation, it will become clear why I'm involved in, 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 in all of these and what is kind of the angle. Uh, and afterwards, we can, if you have any questions, just feel free to ask afterwards. Okay, let's jump in right in. Why using open source and inner source principles to manage actually open source and inner source? <laughs> Um, first of all, let me just introduce uh, the term OSPO. OSPO is an open source program cent, uh, office. It's basically, um, as I said here, the center of competence. Uh, Anna from the Dudu group made this really nice picture of kind of how, what actually an OSPO, OSPO does. So think of this in your traditional enterprises, you have a procurement department that procures, say, software from vendors. In the open source world, you don't have that. And uh, you have this whole open source ecosystem on one side and you have your organization on the other side. And because in open source, everything is free, you get, uh, yeah, it gets very, very complicated, very, very easy. Um, and basically your OSPO is there to help you, an organization basically work better with open source. So it's both on the in inbound side and in the outbound side. So that's uh, what an OSPO does. An OSPO can have uh, many, many responsibilities. Um, I took some of, uh, here from the, um, the, the uh, OSPO mind map. And one of them, of course, includes uh, manage, implementing uh, inner source practices. To be clear, this is the responsibilities an OSPO could do. Not every, like my OSPO is not your OSPO. It, it, every organization might fill in the responsibility differently. But uh, on the, in the mind map, we try to list all of the various uh, um, uh, things, responsibilities an OSPO could do, and in my case, inner source also falls under, under my OSPO. So the question that I really have been working on for, for quite a while is, I said, how do I do manage open source at scale, at speed, while basically staying safe, so looking at vulnerabilities, uh, the fact I want to respect licenses, so again, just because open source is free, it comes with a license, I want to respect that license, it's the minimum what you can do, you should do much more, but the minimum you should respect the license that comes with the open source. I want to also work on, on, on enabling upstream sustainability, right, if we build stuff on open source, and that project dies because nobody funds it, yeah, that's not really good business for us. And finally, of course, we need to do all of this many we still want to make life easier for our developers, which are developers generally with a whole shift left movement. They're already overloaded. They have already enough to do. So we should really build things that they can use open source that makes it easy for them, that makes it easy for them to contribute. It makes it easy for them to introduce uh, new open source in, uh, in, in, in the organization. But um, yeah, this comes from a uh, to-do group survey. Uh, Generally, again, OSPOs have usually lots of responsibilities, a lot of tasks that they do, but they are generally underfunded. And they're usually, an, 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 it, it really depends on the organization, but uh, a lot of OSPOs when they started is one person, two person. The more experienced OSPOs, you will see that they, they have actually usually a full eight, or I know even OSPOs that have 20 people. Uh, but generally there's always so much to do and there's there, there is always a lack of funding. So. This is also when I was, uh, and again, I'm talking now back when I started, when I was working at, um, at Here Technologies years, years ago, when I founded my OSPO, I, it instantly we ran into a number one challenge. We had to handle a lot of compliance in, inquiries regarding licensing, regarding security and, and contributions. Um, why was that? Well, it was actually simple. Like the company was working, it's kind of part of the automotive business. You have a lot of, if you look at automotive, you have a lot of disruption now. So you have electrification, you have self-driving cars. So basically that all drives the need for software. And basically a majority of that software is open source. So you get a big 
inbound, then that open source doesn't work. So then there's also a big outbound to make that software work for, for basically business use cases. But you have a very small team. So basically, instantly firefighting is, is usually what I see in a lot of OSPOs where they're like, ah, open source is just growing, growing, growing. It's great, but we, we, uh, we don't have the manpower to take care of that. So then I actually realized already that actually I could use inner source to build a best, better OSPO. So if you think about it, basically from a, the compliance point of view, my organization is using open source, but it's free and it's not managed properly. And what we figured out, especially at here, a lot of the teams were using the same open source, but there were different, different versions. So basically we, we were using open source inefficiently and that was resulting in a higher compliance burden. So then I was like, hang on, I can use open source uh, sorry, in a source to basically help the various teams basically like, look, you now are all picking your own version of a particular open source library. But if you basically, if we put an inner source project in between, then where you all basically use the same version of a particular open source library that all of you are using, then we only have to do the compliance once and that will save you a lot of, a lot of burden. So it took a little bit of effort, but there were 17 SDK products that basically did that approach and basically they moved, I think about 30 uh, open source libraries that we shared. And like, yeah, afterwards it was like a huge saving. The other thing that I started doing like, is, is how my OSPO operates. I was just like, hang on, um, I have a small team. Um, we cannot foresee everything that happens in the organization, all the twists and turns. Um, if we are just generally open to contributions, and that, that means like our wiki page is open, our, our, our JARAs are open, everything you can just follow up. Then people, when they don't like something, I, I, we always had text on the like, yeah, if you don't like something, file an issue, or literally add at the page on the go. And this might sound very scary, but uh, yeah, we, of course, we had review workflows in place. But after a while, you basically saw that people uh, really started contributing. So it's actually two ways. So it's like using inner source to let's get better efficiently or efficiently use open source, but also use inner source to basically how uh, my approaches from my team towards the, the rest of the organization. So then we're looking at why we looking at why did we use um, do it my OSPO the open source way? Um, well, that is actually um, relatively straightforward. Um, so um, we were at, at some point we had to uh, the, we had to pick new um, tooling to basically work as an OSPO, and um, we started looking at the, so, the commercial tools, so-called software component analysis tools, uh, that are generally recommended for an OSPO to manage uh, open source. And yeah, I still watch. I track about 140 of them even till this day, and they just were not meeting our requirements. And and it's like. Talking to some of my peers since I have a long open source background, and so like, yeah, they, they basically said like, <laughs> it's kind of you, you're basically being uh, forced to tick the the best, best of the words, and so yeah, and so yeah, I'm forced to pick the best words, and they were very expensive, and um, and we also quickly figured out while doing this review that basically we actually we needed multiple tools from different vendors from different open source tools, and we need to for what we need we need to glue them together to get where we wanted to go. Um, but then came the realization that, hang on, hang on, we as organizations, we are using open source, but that open source, there are several challenges in there with our licensing, security, or sustainability. And we as, as individual organizations are trying to patch this up on our end. Like, that makes no sense because we are using as organization more and more uh, open source. So we get a, we, like it was going hockey puck. And then, so more and more of these broken things came in and then we had to patch up, patch up, patch up by so like, no, 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 makes no sense. Like, uh, it makes much more sense if I fix things upstream once and then all sequential versions will have the fix in it than us basically patching every, whenever a new version of a particular open source library, patching up every version and every version. So it did, it did, it really didn't work. And then we looked at like, oh, so hang on. Yeah, when I started there, uh, and it's even now, there is no like a, an OSPO reference manual that you can say like, oh, this is how you run an OSPO. And exactly, if you follow this book, you're, you're, you're done for. It's really like you have to learn from others and then adopt it to the specific of your organization. And, and finally, we realized that basically, him, if we want to basically, as an organization, make 
do anything in the open source community and basically, especially in our in, in open source, we are a small organization. We're not a Google or an Amazon. How can we basically have some voice as a small organization in, in, in this ecosystem? And that's like, Ayan, if we do our things to open source, if we solve a problem that's kind of neglected, then maybe we'll get a seat on the table and we can influence uh, some things that will better for our organization. So then I started like, okay, let's look at all the scaling challenges. Let's let's try to do this in process and toolings, like break this all down. And I came with this long list of uh, of, of, of things. Um, and I was like, okay, okay, now, 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 now let's look at it. So, hmm, what are we gonna do? Well, of course, the most obvious thing is to use uh, automation, right? We have uh, we have toolings on stuff. We have open source. Like, hmm, let's 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 look at it. Like, look automation. And then I um and I know this slide is maybe a little bit uh, dense, compact. This is literally basically the piece of paper that I found actually that I wrote years ago when I was working on this. Um, one of the realizations that I had is when I was um. I do a lot of what we call this system thinking. So instead of just looking at my area, I was just looking at the whole organization, how the whole organization flows and end to end. And what I realized is that the challenges from engineering, security, licensing, open sourcing, the business continuity team and inner source, they all require the same data. And so, yes, you can use all different tools for them, but like, Yes, we could bought a security tool, but a security tool we couldn't use for licensing. And we could also not use it for inner source. Um, so you had different teams in different do uh, tools in different domains. But what we really needed to have is, again, take all of this information that we had and combine it together. And then we could solve actually all of the use cases. And we could solve some cases that even uh, particular uh, uh, specific tools could not solve. And so now let me go to a, a little bit more clarity picture on this. Um, so this is actually a very simple, actually I made a more complex graph in, in, at the time in here, but this is basically how I saw the information workflow uh, for, for all of the different, uh, for my uh, sister teams, like in security, in, in legal, they were all dealing with the same workflow where we all needed similar information. So we needed to know what packages were included, um, so we needed a so-called SBOM or software bill of material. Think of that as an ingredients list for our software. We need to know what open source uh, was in there. And uh, we needed to uh, uh, know uh, what, uh, um, uh, what, like, what are the features, what are the licenses. But more importantly, what we also needed to know is where are people with skills? So we need to know where in our organization are the, the people that know a particular open source library, know how to work with it. Like this is a very common um, engineering topic that came up from like, oh, uh, do we know somebody that knows React or have we built a solution similar like this already in our organization? And so when I realized that it's like, hang on, we need all of that information. Okay, okay, I, 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 know, I know I get it. So then I was like, okay, so we know what information we need. Now let's look at the basic like review process. And I started really drawing this out uh, together with my colleague. It's like, okay, the most simplest workflow is you have some code change, you scan if it's okay, thumbs up, you have some compliance artifacts uh, coming out. If it's not okay, then well, probably a code change is needed in the project or its internal dependencies, or more likely corrections are needed. I, we read us quickly on when doing tooling evaluations, no tool is perfect. So you always have to fix up the data that's in, in such a tool where you either, whether from the packages that were detected, the licensing or the security, you always need to make cor um, corrections. Um, but one of the things that we didn't like there is a lot of this is uh, when you make corrections, it's what we call notify and ignore workflows. The tool would flag, scan something, would flag something, and the developer would just click ignore, not, realize, not really fixing this, the, the, the problem at core. And of course, the third option, when there's not a case, always you would talk to the experts, right? Or the OSPO, the legal. So this is a very basic workflow. And when I was looking at the commercial tools, I, I noticed something that I was, thought was really weird. So every of this loop is per individual R&D team or per individual software project, um, which make no sense for me because I was like, hang on, we are using the same open source 
and also commercial libraries uh, throughout organizations. So we're doing the same clearance work and corrections over and over. This makes no sense. And then I was like, why are we not using InnoSource? Like, why don't we just curate it once and, and do things together as an organization because we're using the same open source um, and then we just reuse that across the whole organization. Um, and that made me realize that like, um, hmm, I can talk afterwards off, off, off the record why that was, why the tools are working like that. But yeah, we, we quickly realized, I'm like, hang on, the workflow makes no sense. If we want to scale, uh, we need to use the collective knowledge of our organization, the collective skill set, and we really need to work in a way that we unlock the developer to basically fix the, pro the issues themselves, um, and so that they're not necessarily blocked. Um, but of course, you need to do it smartly that you have a kind of a review workflow uh, afterwards. So next i was looking at like okay hang on uh, okay so there's no manual where can i get all the knowledge where can i build the various components that i needed and so as i went on and this started actually originally with me coming in touch with michael Picht from sap uh, oliver fenn from siemens and uh, marcel kutzman from, from bosch and as we go along we realized that basically yeah, we were some, all, all of these OSPOs were solving the same kind of challenges. So let's not work together. And that's when we started actually <laughs> founding initiatives uh, or joining initiatives to basically build all of the various parts, whether it's basically learning as a community how to manage open source under like the to-do group. Um, so we founded the, the, the European chapter of the to-do group. Then we started working on like the standards. So like, hey, we are all interconnected. We need to exchange information about our open source use. And we need we want to make certain that our processes meet a certain standard. That's where open chain and SPX came in. And, and, and so then we looked at like, oh, hang on. We actually have, uh, like I was talking to Michael Picht, uh, uh, it's like, hang on, SAP is doing inner source. We are doing inner source. Can, can we not learn from each other what works and what doesn't work? And, and so that on, get on, went on and on. And finally, we basically looked at automation. It's like, oh, yeah, there are some open source tools there, but that's not really what we liked. So then we started a, a project in that space. Um, so let's look at further at uh, the how of uh, uh, the optation. As I said, I already hinted it. It's, uh, it's a tool called OSS Review Toolkit, or, or ORT for short. Um, what it is basically, it's we, we call it a, a, a FOSS policy automation orchestration tool. Um, what, it, what it really does is basically it takes various components and various data and basically glues them originally together to enable us to basically use open source in a strategic, safe, and efficient manner. Um, but over time, basically, the glue grew into real uh, components. And that's basically because the, the tool is, um, is developed by its users. It's really people that were like in, in the open source and OSPO community that were trying to solve their own challenges. And instead of basically taking a commercial tool and, and extending it to their own needs, which was, is kind of the default still, they basically look at it like, well, we understand that the only solution forward is open source, um, but I, as an as my own organization, cannot do this. But if we work together, we can do more. And that's also when we realized that basically, um, if we basically open not only open source the tooling, but also the data and, and the, the policies, this will help us move forward collectively. So again, we as users, as I said, I, uh, for instance, uh, ORT is, is co-maintained by, for instance, uh, by, by Bosch, they're one of the major corporate units. EPAM and Bosch, we don't compete <laughs> on how, how good uh, uh, we each other manages our open source or inner source. This is basically a thing that we have to do to enable business value for organizations. So yeah, we're not competing this, so we can collaborate. And so then we had to implement all the, the basic features that a lot of the commercial tools of course has. Uh, but of course, yeah, we knew the issue, so we decided to do it better. And so we did, uh, we have license scanning, we have security scanning, but also what we started doing is like, hang on, we have, uh, we have engineering standards and inner source things that we roll out the organization. And that's the same information. So hang on, we started adding like best practices and inner source scanning. And of course, because of our exchange, we started doing this uh, software bill of materials. So this is kind of in a nutshell, how the, the tool kind of looks like. Um, it's, as I said, it's really meant to kind of like 
provide an open source pipeline um, for, I say, helping the journey or the open source or inner source journey of your organization. And, it, and, and the idea is basically we try to do as much as possible open source, but where needed, we plug in kind of um, commercial tools. Um, so it starts on the left side with basically like analyzing the code repository. So you kind of get a dependency graph. Then uh, we get all of the source codes and then we do operations on top of the source code. We can scan it for copyrights and licenses. We can do kind of inner source checks on top of it. Uh, we can we, sh we want to go also to do more security checks. What we now just do is we check for like against uh, security advisor databases. And then you have this huge amount of data that um, again, most organizations, <laughs> we, we don't use like uh, uh, 10 or 40 open source libraries. In the, <laughs> what I commonly see is you look easily at 20K, but in organizations that are like a thousand plus, you're looking easily at hundreds and thousands of open source. You, you have this little, this mountain of, of open source, uh, uh, um, like compliance data, inner source data, whatever you com comes at you. And you need to make sense of that. And you need to be able to, to basically go to this um, uh, huge amount of data and make risk driven decisions. And that's where we again say like, okay, hang on. Uh, we need to have something that's programmable. We really want to be able to decide how we uh, as an organization at multiple levels uh, decide what is okay or not okay. And so at the bottom of this slide, you see this kind of this mathematical formula that we came up with, um, which basically um, says thumbs up or thumbs down depends on like what code are we reviewing? What are the licenses that are in there? Which project, which product are we shipping? How are we shipping it to, to, to the customers? To which country is it being shipped? What is the security uh, uh, um, regulations or agreements that we have for the context? What are the, the, the inner source uh, um, uh, agreements that were made within the, within the unit? What did we agree contractually with the customers? And how do we look at, the, for the open source that we use, how do we look at the communities that were basically related to that? And you really want to make a formula out of there to basically have that like, hmm, is it okay to add this new library? Yes or no? Can we ship this? Yes or no? And so it's not a simple policy rules like what we commonly see is like oh uh yeah this license is thumbs up this license system down um because that what you'll see there is you will if you have like one size to, to rule them all you kind of get that it always either trends down really down <laughs> uh, and and then it's yeah it's maybe great for startups but it doesn't work if you're like in the automotive telecom or banking business like high compliance industries or trends all the way up where basically uh the, the compliance rules and are so strict and so strictly enforced that really it basically kills any incentive to use open source so we really wanted to be able to have kind of multiple levels of rules um to 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 basically uh enable that Maybe let's uh, let's do a little demo. And now I have to look at the bar that's above, which I cannot now see. Uh, let me see if I can switch. There we go. So um, the ORT tool itself is on, on GitHub. It's uh, Apache 2 uh, licensed. Uh, so it's really easy, easy to... Uh, to get started, um, the, the, the recommended way to get started is basically using one of our, our CI integrations, which is usually, um, for instance, most people are familiar with GitHub. Um, this is basically uh, uh, how to get started with GitHub. Uh, what we also do is we have a ORT configuration uh, repository. This contains all of the data bits. So it contains like things where we do fix up for licensing. Uh, we have example rules. Um, and there's like everything that you kind of needed to, 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 to basically get a working in, um, to get set up in, in your organization. So the idea is basically that instead of you having to figure out everything yourself, you should be able to then go to your boss and say, look, I took the way how say Bosch or EPAM internally do things and we just get the template from that and we just customize this to our needs. So you don't have to reinvent the wheel uh, entirely. You can just build on what others has done, clearly following the open source. So 
Now I wanted to show you a little bit kind of an idea of how these kind of um, rules look like. And again, I can do a way down and longer deep dive on this in a whole separate workshop, but I just wanted to give you a hint. So here we have a rule that basically checks for a, uh, a missing uh, readme file. Um, and basically, if there is no readme file, it, it basically will throw a, uh, a policy violation. And here we have a rule where we said like, yeah, we want to have a readme file, but we also want to have a, a licensing section uh, within this readme file. So what we're really trying to do is, I think the pattern is uh, standard based documentation. I have to remember the inner source pattern name, but we had some basic, some like readme MD, contributing MD, the basic files that you want to have in a, uh, a code repository, you want to have those basically, or it can just check that. And, and for us, it's like makes sense because uh, having these kind of rules are exactly the same rules if you think about open sourcing code. If, uh, open sourcing code, you, you, if you follow best practices uh, of the community, uh, you, when you open source a project, you should have a readme MD, you should have a contributing MD, which is kind of similar as that to, 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 to inner source best practices. So. Uh, for us, it makes sense to have this all in uh, in, in, in one go and one rule. So just give you a, a hint of uh, how this kind of um, reports look like. So ORT is meant to really integrate within DCI to C pipeline. And it, it it's, might be a little bit weird because there's not really a server, but it produces basically plain artif artifacts. Uh, and, and one of those is, uh, is what we call the web app. It's a single HTML. Uh, page report, and uh, this basically sh should contain everything that a developer needs to uh, to fix any issues that reflect. Now, the nice thing about this, and I'm, I'm just showing it here for licensing, is uh, how we fix issues. We also do this via inner source. So. Uh, whenever there is a, like you have a copy left, copy left is kind of, well, some lawyers are not fans of, of copy left. Let me, uh, let me, let, 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 that. What we basically said is basically whenever we throw a policy violation, we, we always, uh, uh, in, in our case, we sell them like how the developer themselves can fix it. And the way how we do this is we basically tell people to make a, a, a pull request on our version of the configuration repository. So this will allow them to basically, uh, we, we kind of give them a recipe, as you can see here, and we say like, look, if this is a violation, then these are the things that you can do. And, and then you can submit a, a pull request basically to our, our, our ROSPO, and then we will, we will review it. Now, of course, when the first time we did this, people were like uh, sending in pull requests that were, well, let's say 80, 90% useless. But because we were familiar with inner source and we knew basically that as long as we said like, said like, hey, it's okay to fail. We know that the first time you get around and it's okay to fail. And then we encouraged them and we really, we said, uh, uh, we really gave them say like saying thanks afterwards to the contributors. And when they, we encouraged them to do better and better. And after like 90 plus days, we were seeing that basically, uh, the, uh, more and more of those contributors for the simple things, for the simple corrections, they were doing this. And after a couple of months more, they were even doing the more advanced license corrections. They, they didn't know anything about licensing per se, um, but we were, they were able to, to do it correctly for the simple cases. For instance, um, in a lot of times you will see open source that has like, MIT is compatible with GPL. Now, GPL is a license in flagged, but in the sentence, like the project is under MIT, but because the word GPL is in there, the scanner will say like, all right, stop. We have, to, we have this has to be fixed. And these are the, the things that the developer can fix, or if a code repository has, we couldn't be scanned because it has moved. So there were all of these things where, where developers could do things. But of course, the way how we implemented the workflow that if they were trying to figure things out, that really required a legal counsel or a security expert, then basically in the, the pool request where we would automatically include them. That's pretty much it from, from, uh, from my side. Um, I would say, let's go to questions. <laughs>